more a holy Jesus Christ went through. Where, where they bring a mock trial up of people trying to accuse him. Everybody knew it was ridiculous. They were just going through the motions. They just needed to get him dead. That's all they needed. You just go through the motions. Doesn't really matter. You know? Get him dead and then everything will be better. But then he rose from the dead. <laughs> they're like, man, he just won't stay down, will he? Then all his followers, man, they're like, man, these guys are crazy. They still won't stop talking about him. I told them I'd kill them if they'd keep doing it, but they don't even fear death. Wow. What love. Amen. Jesus was and is loving. Jesus loved the, loved the unlovable. The, le the love of Jesus was manifested in loving lepers. Think about that. I mean, think about a person that is so contagious that you can get this disease. You think about it. And Jesus walks right up to him. Give him a hug. What's up, brother? How's it going? Cry on my shoulder, brother. I love you, man. This guy's like, nobody's even touched me for five years, and you're, you're sitting here hugging me. That's right. And so that's the love of Jesus, loving tax collectors, loving prostitutes, loving cursing fishermen. That's some love. He loved the unlovable. These were all people, amen, these were all people that the world rejected as the base things. You know, they look at the prostitutes, good for nothing. They look at that cursing fisherman, you just stay on your boat, man. You just stay on your boat. You know, you stink. You just hang around with the fish all day, you smell. The lepers, I mean, unclean, man. Unclean. And Jesus is like, those are the exact people I'm going to use right there. <laughs> The ones who are rejected, you know. Um, I I, uh, I was brought to um, an early dinner from a brother. From a brother. Uh, this is back a few years ago, and this brother was trying to get my pastor at the time thrown out. And uh, he says on the phone, he says, "Make sure." Make sure you bring your wife. Because we've we got to talk. Make sure you bring your wife. And we get there to a McDonald's. I guess he was going to buy for me. A McDonald's, man? You can't, even, you can't even spend five bucks on me? Brother? You know, anyway. We pull up in the parking lot, and this guy gets out. And you know who's not there? His wife. I'm like, where's your wife? Oh, she's at home with the kids. You know, they had an old enough daughter. She could have definitely been okay coming with her husband. So I'm like, why'd you ask me to bring my wife? You know, the devil normally try to go through the woman, just for the record, right? So we're, we're approaching the entrance, and there's all these, uh, all these uh, skaters out there smoking cigarettes and drinking beer in front of... In front of uh, McDonald's, he says, a guy like this, or a guy like me being around people like this. You know what he didn't realize? He didn't realize where I was about three years prior, about four years prior at that time. And he went in there and it just was a big sham. But you know what? God gave me that red flag before he, the dude even talked. What's a guy like me doing around people like me? You know what? Those are the people Jesus died for right there. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't a guy like you be around people like that? Those are the people Jesus died for. Amen? And I think a lot of times independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptists are some of the worst, prideful, arrogant, rude people I've ever met. Amen, praise the Lord. I'll just put it out there like that. You know, some of those drinking beer, smoking cigarettes, skaters got more morals than people I've met in some churches. If I break your skateboard, I'll buy you a new one. Hmm. I've seen it long before I was saved, man. That's how it was. That's how it was. But you know what? 
We need to compare ourselves with Jesus. Quit comparing ourselves with the person sitting next to you or someone you think is holy in, inside the church. You know, uh, th these holy rollers inside the church, man, you, you know what? They stay inside for so long, you know, they stay out of the sun. The sun gives you health. When you go outside the doors, you actually get healthy just being outside. But these people stay inside so much, they lose their brain. They do. They really do. Their hands are too soft, man. They, they, they haven't worked a shovel, man, or a rake. I mean, you, you got to get out there and plow a little bit, man. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, you, you keep doing that, men. You keep staying inside too much, you're going to start becoming effeminate. That's a sin. That's Amen. a sin to be effeminate. Yep. But Jesus, he loved in all seriousness. He loved in all seriousness. His love that he had for his enemies was manifested with a loud voice and a cat of nine tails. You know, if Jesus didn't love those money changers, amen, <laughs> he would have just walked the other way. Or he would have just zipped his mouth, zipped his lips, and just walked on through all those money changers. But what did he do? Well, let's look at it. Go to John chapter 2. what real love looks like. See, now this is where this is where psychology and the Bible are a complete opposite. Psychology is changing. The Bible is not. Psychology is developing as they make more uh, educated decisions or ed educated uh, uh, theories. That's all they have is the theories. We're in John chapter 2. And it says, uh, verse 13, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords... So he actually took time to do this. Jesus is like, hmm. Starts picking up things. He's like, huh. Yeah. That's a good knock for that one. That'll, that'll stay, you know? I mean, he, he's like, yeah, you, you want to wanna turn my father's house into a den of thieves, huh? Okay, all right. When he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. Now, this doesn't mean in a Honda Accord, amen? He didn't say, hop in, guys, let's go. He actually took this whip. This handmade DIY <laughs> whip. Amen? And and he starts to hit people. <laughs> I mean, you think about it. I mean, you, you think about... He's a, he's a carpenter, so he's probably pretty physical stature. You know, pretty good stature. Not beautiful, we know that. You know, but... So he... I mean, think about it. If he just says, hey, leave. Guy's like, you leave. This is my business. What are you talking about? Get out of here. Huh? Then Jesus takes out this whip. Uh, what are you going to do with that? This is what I'm going to do with that. Whack! I'm going to hit you with it until you leave. You know, and he starts throwing over tables and stuff. And you know what a lot of people think? Is that this was probably the only time he did this. At the wedding of Cana, that was his first miracle. You realize he did it again? Amen. He did it twice. He did Turn your Bible over to Matthew 21, later in his ministry. So when, when he first got started, he went in there and cleaned out the temple. And then at the end of his ministry, we're in Matthew 21, look at verse 12. Matthew 21 and verse 12. And by this time, look at verse 11, they already know who he is. And the multitude said, verse 11, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. They know exactly who he is by now. He's been walking around three and three and a half years. Look at verse 12. Jesus went to the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Did it twice. 
That's a loving God right there. Amen. You know that He'd do it once and let you get sideways again, and He does it again. See, Jesus could have just lit that whole place on fire with His eyes if He wanted to. <laughs> just, I mean, you forget who you're dealing with, amen? amen? You think about Jesus in the second advent. This man literally comes with eyes of flame of fire and a tongue that's a sword. I mean, this is Jesus Christ. And I mean, we know he, the Mount of Transfiguration, he could, he could transfigure anytime he wants. He's God. You're forgetting who you're dealing with. But you know what? Instead, he drives him out of the temple in a physical way. You know, he gets loud and he drives him out not once but twice. That's a true love. It manifested itself in a public rebuke or a chastisement. See, you know, there's some parents, you know, and the, they'll sit, I just sit in the grocery line sometime, amen, and these kids are just going crazy, man. <laughs> They're flying around, and you know what, the, the parent doesn't want to do nothing in front of you. You know, and he just maybe grab his hand, hopefully. Sometimes they just let them run and hope that they make it back to the car in time to leave. But, you know, sometimes they'll just grab their hand and just hold them, you know, next to them. But, you know, I've, I've seen some parents, man. Just say, let's go, Junior. Yeah. You want to make you want to make a fool out in public? Let's make a fool. You know, and uh, that's biblical. Yeah. That's biblical. I'm not saying close-handed, rip their head off, beat them. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that stuff. I'm saying chastisement. What do you mean? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. No Hebrews chapter 12. What's it say? What's the Bible say? Do you love your children? Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 6. Show you how you know if, if, uh, if uh, you're God's son. Amen. If you're part of His own. And uh, how God deals as a loving father with His children. We're in Hebrews 12, 6. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth, Every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasten, chasteneth not? Look at this, verse 8. But if ye be without ch chastisement, whereof all are partakers. He's saying every son of God gets chastised. All, okay? So if ye be without chastisement, where all are partakers... Then are you bastards and not sons. So you know what? This whole uh, politically correct human resources, uh, social services method of uh, raising your children without chastisement is anti-scriptural. I, I mean, I'm no emotion in it. It's just nothing to do with me. Obviously, I don't even have kids right now. I see well, I've got one on the way in the mail. I'm still waiting for the Preach. package. Amen. <laughs> still waiting for the package. But you understand that this is how God loves His child. Do you love your child? You love him? You love her? And uh, so Jesus, He loved in all seriousness. He was one to get loud over it. He's one, he's one to chastise. But He loved enough to tell the truth. He's a God of love, right? This is the one thing that street preachers are most misunderstood on. He loved them enough to tell the truth, yet are always accused of not being loved, loving enough. You, you, you go out there, and you know, today if you go out there, we'll probably be accused of not being loving. Because why? Because we're bringing the Word of God straight to their face. See, there is a time to pipe down and pray. I agree with that. There is a time. But that time is long past in this country. That time is long past in the Antelope Valley. And then when, when, the, uh, when the Sodomites are having annual meetings and festivals right here, stones throw from this building, I mean, they are here, man. I mean, all that lovey-dovey stuff, amen, I'm sure it, it had its part years ago in the Antelope Valley. But that, that, that time is gone. I'm sorry, man. You know, if, if you remain quiet, if you remain quiet, you know what that means? You're in acceptance. Right. Amen. 
I'm not. 